In a recent article in Toronto Life magazine, Desmond Cole writes that he has been stopped by police on more than 50 occasions. Why? Well, he's convinced it's because of the color of his skin. This in a city that prides itself on its diversity. This in a city that has just appointed its first black chief of police. Joining us now for more, here's Desmond Cole, staff writer for Torontoist. He's also having written the cover of the Toronto Life magazine, and the piece is called The Skin I'm In. It's in the May edition. Great to have you here at TVO. Thanks for having me. You know, I gotta say, I've known you for a while. You've been a guest on the agenda many times. I had no clue that this was a part of your past until I'd read this piece. When did you first realize that you were getting treated differently from, say, people with white skin in this city? In this city, um, well, let me, let me maybe go back because... You wanna I, go back to Queens? I wanna go back to Queens okay. because, you know, I grew up in Oshawa, Ontario, and uh, there aren't a lot of black people in Oshawa, but I never had any problems with the police ever. Quite the opposite, actually. They were wonderful. I remember all my memories growing up of interacting with cops was wonderful. But when I went to Queen's University, that all changed. And I noticed particularly that people started following me in my car. Police officers would follow me when I was driving. And I seriously, Steve, thought I was paranoid when this started happening to me. And I describe in the piece that I would take just any route just to see, just to make turns and just to see if I actually was being followed. And you were. And I was. And this scared me because I thought, I don't want to, for example, go home right now because I don't want them to know where I live. I don't know why they're following me, but I don't want them to know where my house is. So I would just drive aimlessly until I thought that they were gone and then I would go home. How many students at Queens when you went there? 15,000. How many black kids? Very few. Um, not 1%, I wouldn't think. Maybe 1%. Is it, a, I mean, was it simply the case that uh, police didn't know black people and didn't know how to handle it? Is that part of it? You know, while I was there, there was an incident with a 13-year-old boy whom police pulled a gun on. He was black. Um, so the idea that police would um, think they needed to approach black people differently is in and of itself problematic for me. You know what I mean? I see that that's what they were doing. But I wonder about so many things. I wonder about recruiting people who inherently have this idea that you need to approach people of a different race with such aggression and hostility as I saw and as other people have seen. The idea that there's not training in place for people to ensure that they are aware of any biases that they may be bringing into the job. You know, this is, it was all so disturbing that this could really, because we know how much authority and responsibility police have and when they abuse it, you know, you don't want to be on the wrong end. Carding a practice has been in the news a lot lately. Yes. For those who don't know what it is, just explain off the top. Carding is a colloquial term that we in the media used because we needed a word to describe this activity that the Toronto Police have been engaging in, which is stopping people who are not suspected of any crime. That's the key. They're not suspected of any crime. And nevertheless, documenting their personal information. It's the combination of those two things. You can stop uh, somebody if you're the police and you can just say, hi, how are you doing? Nobody has a problem with that. Um, it's the documentation of people who are not suspected of anything, and then the entering of that information into a police database that's been concerning for people. That's what carding is. How many times have you been carded? Me personally, I, I say in the piece that I've been stopped uh, over 50 times. I've probably been carded in my memory maybe 12, 15 times <laughs> that I've been asked for identification by the police. Well, here's what you wrote in the piece. You wrote, I have been stopped if not always carded, at least 50 times by the police in Toronto, Kingston, and across southern Ontario. By now, I expect it could happen in any neighborhood, day or night, whether I am alone or with friends. These interactions don't scare me anymore. They make me angry. Because of that unwanted scrutiny, that discriminatory surveillance, I am a prisoner in my own city. You do point out, though, in the piece, though, Desmond, that when they, the approach often is not hostile. Mm -hmm. It's often, hey, what are you up to, or how are you doing, or what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Fair to say? That's fair. That's how it starts. Mm -hmm. It often starts off extremely friendly. And where does it go? Almost a little too friendly, I too would friendly. say. Where does it go? It goes from, hi, how are you doing, um, to what are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you going with? Um, do you live around here? Are they allowed to ask these questions? They are allowed. I mean... Free country, you can say whatever you want, but Are you I already. To I walk away? This is a great question. 
I have the charter right and you have the charter right and everyone has the charter right not to be arbitrarily detained by the police. But it gets tricky. The reason that it gets tricky is because police have guns and a badge and a huge amount of authority. When a police officer asks you something, you may have the charter right not to answer or to walk away, but you might not feel safe doing so. And this is a phenomenon that's called psychological detention. And it's been documented a lot because uh, the law understands that people want to obey the orders of the police. The police are there to keep us safe. And so it's understandable that a person might be like, okay, I know I have the right to leave, but what will happen if I do? Will I make this person angry? Could there be some kind of retribution against me if I try to leave? Yeah, but what about the 50th time? Huh. By the 50th time, you're ready to... Have you ever blown up at a cop for doing this? Absolutely, I have. I've, I've actually told them I won't give you anything. I've told them go away, I've told them I'm not doing anything wrong. And I feel scared even standing up for myself that much. Depending on the situation, sometimes I don't say that. Because if I'm alone, if it's at night, what I, what I find so funny about carding is, Steve, you hear these anecdotes about, oh, the guy walking around at 3 AM in a dark alleyway. Don't you think I'm scared when I'm walking at night and I get approached by two large people with weapons and with authority? I am the one who is scared. And the idea is that people are scared of me. But it's actually the reverse. And so yeah, you get frustrated, you get angry, but you have to think about what you're going to say and keep yourself safe. The Toronto police say they have made some changes to their practicing of carding lately. Have they? Not really. Um, there's some major things that were asked of the police by the board and some, some things that were asked by the community. So I want to just go over a couple of them. Mm. Uh, most of them were directives from the board, which is supposed to be overseeing what the police do. The, the board said, look, if you want to stop people, create um, a really narrow reason for why you would stop somebody and take their personal identification. You can't just do that to anyone because they happen to be within your reach. You've got to have a good reason. Uh, the police didn't do that. They did the opposite. They created what they called a public safety purpose for carding. And Steve, it's so broad I could drive a truck through it. Hmm. it. It gives the police any latitude to stop you for pretty much any reason. So they failed on that front, I think. The board said, tell people that they have the right to walk away, this idea of psychological detention. There's nothing about that in the policy. Um, the board didn't ask for receipts for carding, but the community have been asking for receipts. So let me explain that a little bit. A card, we call it carding, because it's a sheet of paper that has all of these slots that the police can write in. And uh, the police often don't ask you for your information. They will describe certain things about you based on their perception. That includes your race. Some police have described the race, or color as it's called on the forum of somebody, as Jamaican. I mean, and you're from Sierra Leone. I'm from Sierra Leone. I mean, that didn't happen. Your ancestors. Yes, uh, my parents are from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen to me. That's ha that happened to somebody that I know named Nia Singh, who's uh, been very public about getting his uh, record of when the police stopped him and what they said about him. And he found out that they said twice that he's Jamaican and he's born in Toronto. Have you seen your records no, that I'm the in, police have? I'm in the process of filing a freedom of information to get that now. But all this to say, you're taking information about me, and you're essentially just another government bureaucrat. So why don't I get to see the information that you're taking about me? Give me a receipt. Give me a carbon copy of your information that you take about me. If you want to take notes somewhere else, I suppose I can allow for that. But give me a receipt. There's no receipt in this new policy. Hmm. So the oversight that was asked for by the civilian board and by the community has been basically ignored by the police. Let me play devil's advocate for a second here, which is to say statistics admittedly that the police collect, show that a disproportionate amount of crime that happens in this city is done by black men. If you're a cop walking a beat or driving a squad car checking the streets and you see a lone black male, 20-something, walking along the streets and you know what the stats say, do your spidey senses tell you, I'm going to go check this out? Yeah, let's get into that because that's, that's the unspoken here and it's... Uh something that I know a lot of people think and they don't want to say. So let me ask you first, what crimes? Are black people disproportionately responsible for all crime in the city of Toronto? No. 
you're probably thinking of, and many people are probably thinking of, very specific kinds of violent crime, inc including... Or drug-related, gang-related, okay. whatever. We know the stereotype. Okay. Um, so I'll say two things about that. One of them is, I don't know any police work, legitimate police work, that says what you do when you know that is that you stop people randomly on the street. You give them a hard time. You take their personal information and put it into a database, and you collect so much of that information about black people that you don't even know what to do with it anymore. Okay? So that's the first problem I have with that. I don't also want to have to be held responsible for the idea, stereotypical as it is in a police officer's mind, that I am more likely to do something based on the color of my skin. I think that's the definition of racism, is saying there's a black person. Hmm, what do I know about black people? Ah. I'd better go talk to them. That's called racism to me. And uh, it says that I can predict someone's behavior by that trait alone. I'm terrified that we have to have this conversation in 2015, Steve. The other thing I'll say quickly just about that is that um, this actually puts people in more harm, and it actually makes communities less safe. The reason it does that is because if you go into a community and you profile everyone based on the color of their skin with this faulty assumption that that's how you keep people safe, you will alienate the vast majority of people who are not doing anything, who are not guilty of any crime, who are not suspected of any crime, and they won't help you when you need them in a community. They will turn their back on you, and I understand why they will turn their back on you. It's because you've treated them like garbage. Right. I want to ask you about uh, one of the biggest stories uh, in the history of this city. It happened last week. The new chief of police for the city of Toronto is a black man. What did you think of that news when you heard it? I celebrated it. Um, I think it's wonderful that we have a black police chief in the city of Toronto. And uh, I think it's something that all of us actually should be celebrating. And the reason why we should all be celebrating it is just like many other areas of our society, it's been very difficult for black people to rise up the ranks of something like the police force. And in fact, two of our candidates, Mark Saunders, who is now the chief designate, mm -hmm. and Peter Slowly, they were two of the first three people to ever be black ch uh, deputy chiefs of police. Keith Ford was the other. Mm -hmm. And this is in very recent times, right? This is in our recent memory. And so it's an accomplishment that we can all celebrate that a black person got there because there have been a lot of barriers in black people's way up to this point. There continue to be, but this is a step forward. So I'm very happy for that. What people tend to do, though, is they tend to mix that in, and then they tend to say, so what will that mean for our city? What will that do? Well, it hasn't meant an end to carding, because I think this new chief is pro-carding. It's ironic, actually, that uh, designate Saunders is in favor of keeping this for the moment, because he's one of the author authors of the Pacer Report. And the Pacer Report is the most in-depth look that the police have done into their own practice of carding. Mm -hmm. And Pacer recommends some incredibly serious reforms to the practice which are the ones that the chief and the board chose to ignore a couple weeks ago when they moved forward on this issue. So, um, you gonna try and change his mind on that? Am I? <laughs> I thought you might. Um, he, I, he, I, he had a great quote, uh, <laughs> quoted all over the place. Let's see this clip and then we'll come back and chat. Okay. Roll it, please. Being black is fantastic. It doesn't give me superpowers. Um, <laughs> So if, if you're expecting that all of a sudden the, the earth will open up and miracles will happen, that's not going to happen. What did you think of that when you heard it? Yeah, that was pretty cute, wasn't it? <laughs> people ate people well, that one up. Um, I'll tell you what I think of that. I think that it's a dodge. And I'll tell you why, Steve. Um, we are not actually asking Mark Saunders, in terms of this issue of carding, to have superpowers. We're just asking for a little bit of common sense and a little bit of courage to take on a police establishment and in a police union, I must mention that on this program, who don't like the idea of reforming the practice of carding and who are putting a lot of pressure on people like Mark Saunders and on the board not to take this uh, illegitimate, in my mind, tool away. Um, I also think, by the way, that he was downplaying a little bit the significance of being the first black chief, and that's why I thought that that comment was unfortunate. Having said that, I presume there is a lot of pressure on him from the black communities of Ontario's capital city to really change the way the force does business, right? Yeah. Too much pressure? 
a lot of pressure. He knew that when he applied, I assume, right? Right. And he's probably been hearing a lot of things from community for many years. And that's what interested me about the comment that Mark Saunders made in his first press conference when he said, you know, on this issue of carding, I really want to reach out to people and I want to listen. He's a 32-year veteran of the police. He's the author of PACER, which had mass consultations with the public about this issue. He's mu he must have heard a lot about this. But let's talk expectations. You know, when Barack Obama became president, I don't have to tell you, everybody thought, oh, racism is over, you know, everything's going to be fine, and the sun's going to come up the next day. Didn't quite work out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are, are the expectations on this chief to improve race relations in this city off the charts? I will go on record first as saying that I didn't think Barack Obama was going to end racism in the United <laughs> States. And I don't expect uh, Mark Saunders to end racism within the Toronto police. And I actually don't think that that's what the community is saying. What the community is saying is that we do expect a lot from you, though. I can't deny that. And we expect you to use your experience as a black person and bring that to bear in the job that you're doing, especially as it relates to this carding issue. I don't think that that's a lot to ask, Steve, because it's very powerful. I actually um, have heard uh, one of the other candidates who uh, I mentioned, Deputy uh, Peter Slowly, he's talked about himself being stopped by the police when he was off duty. Hmm. It's happened to him multiple times. I legitimately want to know if this has happened to Mark Saunders. I want him to talk about it. I want him to talk about how it made him feel. I want him to talk about if he thought he was doing anything suspicious that warranted him being stopped and questioned before police actually realized who he was, when of course I'm sure that would be immaterial. But that's the way in which his experience as a black person can influence how he does his job. And I actually think it's a fair expectation from people to say, we do expect you to go there because if you were white, you wouldn't be able to. We don't expect him to end racism after his first month on the job. No. There's no doubt about that. But perhaps you could tell us what your hopes for his tenure as police chief would be. Yeah, this would go beyond the issue of police carding and in, into a lot of other things that I've reported on and read about. Um, what we need, what I would have wanted to see on the uh, application, as it were, for a new chief would be like, are you going to vigorously uphold and defend people's civil rights? That, I think, is a central problem that we've had in this city. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, you covered the G20, Steve, better than almost anybody. Um, you know what happened. You know about over 1,000 people being arrested and detained without charge. Over 1,500. Is 1,500. Yep. Thank you very much. So um, that was a really bad mark on our city. And it hurt relations with the police very badly. I want a police chief who can promise us that something like that will never happen again. I want a police chief who can say that the practice of strip searching people, did you know that in, uh, I believe it was 2013, um, a third of all arrests by the police resulted in a strip search, one third. And they found nothing 99% of the time in terms of uh, searching for drugs, searching for weapons. They say that they found a lot of things that could be used to uh, escape custody or potentially harm oneself oh, or a police officer. done to humiliate. The, the, the feeling by many people is that it's being done to humiliate or intimidate people. It's happening far too much anyway. One third is way, way, way too much. I want a police chief who says, look, we, we have to cut down on that to restore public trust. Of course I want a police chief who's going to either end the practice of carding altogether or reform it to uh, a satisfactory level where we can say this conforms to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, because many of us do not believe that it does as it is currently practiced. And, and therefore restore some trust in the community. These are all rights issues. Some of them affect specific communities. I, I would argue that most things that the police do when they're done incorrectly could have a disproportionate effect on a lot of different groups of people. But this is about reform for the entire city. It's about refor reforming and restoring trust within the entire city. Let's spend our last couple of minutes going full circle and talk about you again. And uh, I think language is important, so let me use the language that you think is the right language to use. Are you a black guy, or are you an African-Canadian, or what do I call you? I personally identify as black. Okay. What's the percentage of blacks in Toronto? Eight, eight and a half, about. Eight percent. and a half? Eight and a half. Is it, are you looking for a world where the other 91.5% of the people look at you and only see Desmond Cole journalist as opposed to Desmond Cole black journalist? No, I'm black. I don't want to not be black. 
I'm proud of who I am. What I don't want is that to affect how people treat me. And that's why this issue of my experiences with the police has been so painful. Because it robs me of my individuality, Steve. It takes away who I am and uh, it turns me into an object for people's fascination and fear. And I don't want that. And you know, on this whole issue that we were mentioning before um, about stopping people based on assumptions about blacks, people say to me all the time, Steve, well, Desmond, you're such a wonderful person. You're so well-spoken. The way you dress, Desmond. I don't always dress like this, by the way. But <laughs> do you know how hurtful that is? That's code, isn't it? It is, yeah. because no kid deserves it if they don't dress like me, if they don't talk like me. My goodness, can't we give people the benefit of the doubt, or is that too much to ask well, for? Well, you know, Joe Biden took some flack on that when he said about Obama that he's so well-spoken and mm. clean and whatever the hell else he said. He had a couple other adjectives there. I think what we fear is this idea of lowered expectations about black people. We don't want people to be surprised that we're accomplished, that we're intelligent, <laughs> that we're diverse in our opinions and in our abilities. In that way, of course I want to be like everybody else, but I'm not going to take away the fact that I am black, I'm proud of being black, and when people see me, they should acknowledge me for all that I am and, and then treat me accordingly, I hope. Desmond, it's a fantastic piece. I'm really glad to have read it. Uh, we recommend it to everybody, uh, Toronto Life Magazine, May edition. Uh, you're going to be back here, I think, later this week because you're taking part in another discussion that we're having. And it's so good of you to come into TVO tonight and share your views on this. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.